All right, y'all, welcome to the Scott Horton Show. I'm the director of the Libertarian Institute, editorial director of Antiwar.com, author of the book Fool's Errand, Time to End the War in Afghanistan, and the brand new Enough Already, Time to End the War on Terrorism. And I've recorded more than 5,500 interviews since 2003, almost all on foreign policy and all available for you at scotthorton.org. You can sign up for the podcast feed there. And the full interview archive is also available at youtube.com slash Scott Horton Show. Hey guys, I got Matt Taibbi, otherwise known as the greatest guy on Substack, on the phone right now. And he's at the Republican convention up there in, uh, what you call, I knew it the other day, Milwaukee, right? Hey Milwaukee. Matt, how are you doing? Uh, how- I'm doing great. How are you doing? Oh, I'm doing good, man. Uh, very happy to have you here. Um, as I always say, I stop whatever I'm doing and I read whatever you send me when I get a sub stack in my email and I get quite a few sub stacks in my yeah, email. I apologize. But, I haven't, haven't sent them. But yeah, man, you do uh, such compelling writing all the time. I love reading it. And, uh, and you know, you're always focused on not exactly what I'm focused on, but always something I'm very interested in. Like for example, in politics, um, and especially right now, what I'm enjoying so much is the backstabbing of Joe Biden by all the Democrats. And you've been you've been writing about this quite a bit. It's Obviously, amazing, isn't it? It's it's just incredible. There's a bunch of Trump news to cover, of course. We've got to talk a little bit about that later and whatever. But the uh, the overthrow of Joe Biden from inside the Democratic Party seems to be making headway. We've got Obama came out against him now, although not officially and apparently not to his face. What do you know about that? Um, well, it's been kind of apparent that Barack Obama has been the source of a lot of the, uh, you know, sort of public campaigning against Biden or public campaigns to, to get him to leave the race since the debates. I think you're seeing kind of a fissure within the Democratic Party where there's one camp that's loyal to Biden, that's mostly confined to people in the white house it sounds like and then uh it's it seems like there are an awful lot of people with ties to either chicago politics or to the last last democratic administration who um who are coming out now and calling for biden to drop out yeah i obviously had big news yesterday that adam schiff and 21 other members of congress called for biden to step down um you know, if if Obama himself is is uh, getting into that, too, it, it's not at all surprising at this point. Yeah. Well, and now so there's a couple of things at issue here. One is which the guy's completely crazy, but he has been for so long. He's not that much crazier than before. I don't know if you saw the latest one where he called his secretary of defense the black man because he couldn't remember the Lloyd Austin's man. name. Yeah. Um, but, you know, okay, maybe he's, like, marginally worse, but I don't know. And then I thought I had seen, and I, I do not check real clear politics, you know, polls every morning, and I really should. But uh, I had read a couple of things that said that actually the debate didn't truly hurt Biden that bad in the polls. It was a, a PR disaster, and maybe a lot of people panicked, and people who were seeking advantage against Biden inside the Democratic Party took advantage. And yet— uh, isn't it the case that Biden has some kind of uh, claim that, look, he's only behind by a couple of points. He was up by two. Now he's down by two. But so what? He can fight back. Or is that not right? So I, I think it's probably right that it's still competitive. Um, the poll they're actually showing as recently as last week. They were talking to one that that showed Biden actually up after the debate, 50 to 48. And there were a few headlines out there that said that Biden was actually now back in the lead. Um, So but I have trouble believing that I've had steadily more and more trouble believing polls in the last eight years. If there was actually polling out there that showed that Biden was anywhere within striking distance uh, of Trump, or if it was, let's just say, closer than four points, I don't think there would be this huge hue and cry to get rid of him, uh, you know, given all of that uh, that, that would imply for the party. Uh, if they if they actually had polls showing him ahead, there's no way that that would be happening. So we just had 
you know, the former head of the Intelligence Committee come out and say that Biden has to get out because he can't win. For me to believe him, you know, up two points or down two points, that doesn't, <laughs> that's hard to accept. Uh, you know, even before this episode, I used to always look at polls in the aggregate, you know, like using tools like the Real Clear Politics uh, averages, right? Like I have a really great site that sort of looks at all the polls about a certain topic over yeah. um, a time period. And I always thought even those you had to kind of just draw j maybe like one general conclusion. Um, but but now I don't know. I, I don't know that even that can be trusted anymore. It's It's difficult. Yeah. OK, so underlying this whole crisis on the Democrat side is that the fact that they've been lying to us this whole time and pretending that everything was fine. Now their back is up against the wall. I guess they were betting on that him doing really good in that debate, but that didn't work out. So now they suspend the primaries and that whole season is over. So how are they going to pick the new nominee if they do, in fact, succeed in overthrowing him? Which I guess, by the way, I forgot if either of us had mentioned this so far, but. They do have a, what purports to be a leak from Biden insiders saying at least he's listening now and saying, well, maybe Kamala Harris could win and this kind of thing. That seemed to be like the first little trial balloon that Biden is softening. But how are they going to replace him? They're just going to let Barack Whoa. Obama decide? Well, Biden himself came out on the He gave an interview to BET last night saying that um, he would consider stepping aside if there was a medical uh event <laughs> so that that was a considerable softening of his position but um so just to answer all those things in order yeah they they, they they're suddenly pretending that this is the first time that they've noticed a problem with biden where whereas it was pretty obvious even the people who covered biden on the campaign trail in 2019 and 2020 uh, as i did that he was having a real problem and they, they tried to call it just a speech problem it really wasn't the real the real problem was that he would uh, forget where he was in the middle of speeches and, and then he, more important than that his uh, emotions were all off he had problems with uh controlling his anger uh he would sometimes uh sort of react or, or he would, he would ma massively overreact to pretty anodyne questions um and but but we were told no this isn't a problem there's nothing wrong it's just a speech impediment uh don't worry about it and now they're all pretending that they didn't see anything all, all that time yeah how can and you pick on a guy for his so childhood stutter well it, right exactly exactly but i i think you kind of you hit on the the worst thing of all which is that they they completely gutted the primary system uh you know, they had opponents removed from the ballot in states like Florida, Tennessee, Massachusetts, um, you know, and they even worse in New Hampshire, they, they had a situation where they they actually had a primary and then they replaced the results of that primary with a second thing that they called a nominating event uh, that was like held in a Saturday night. Uh, an undisclosed location with uh, a few party officials and they apparently were were choosing from a ballot that only had one name on it and that's those are the delegates that are going to be sent to uh to the democratic convention not not the actual votes um which is amazing so they went through this whole non-democratic process now they're talking about doing this thing called a blitz primary where the delegates would get to choose and it's very complicated it's never really well it's sort of been done in 1968 it's it's complicated but um it it, it i i just don't know how people are going to look at that and say that this nominee is going to come from any kind of democratic process yeah and then so help me go down the list because i admit this is not my speciality but as far as i know their best guy is Gavin Newsom just because he's got hair, I guess, still, although he does have a bit of that Horton pattern baldness. So I don't know like if <laughs> he's really got an advantage there or not, but he's also the guy that ran California into the ground. But do yeah. they have anyone who's even close to him as far as fundraising ability, TV respectability, whatever that they could try to build a campaign around? 
It's funny. Everybody just skips over Kamala Harris. I didn't even mean to. Sorry, lady. No, it's uh, it's it's interesting because they brought up a bunch of names. Um, you know, the, the there there was a leak in well, it wasn't a leak. It was a story done in Semaphore, which uh, talked about. Um, there, there's an, a Georgetown law professor named Rosa Brooks who proposed this thing called a, a blitz primary. And the idea was they would um, have somebody, some, in some cases, it's been the idea is that uh, former presidents like Barack Obama and Bill Clinton would choose like the top six nominees. And then they would have like a little mini campaign uh, for a few weeks. Uh, and then the delegates would vote among those candidates. It, you know, so they bring up names like Gretchen Whitmer, uh, Amy Klobuchar, Newsom, obviously, is one of them. Uh, but what's really interesting is that th- there is one poll that shows that the best, the, the candidate who polls best is actually Hillary Clinton um, oh my God. out of all those folks, which is shocking, but also not because a lot of this is about name recognition. Mm-hmm. So uh, I you know, I wrote a column about this. I wouldn't be I wouldn't be shocked if it turned out to be her. But uh, but I, I, I think they can kind of, they, they'd have to be able to find somebody who's better. I think almost anything, anybody, if they just sort of pick somebody out of the phone book would do better than Gavin Newsom um, yeah. or, you know, Amy Klobuchar or, or Kamala. They, 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 these people are all unelectable, I, I think. Uh, it's just a ama- Yeah. Imagine putting running Klobuchar against Trump. Uh, it's so funny, you know, when you said Hillary Clinton there, I immediately thought of Bill Hicks talking about, he's complaining about Reagan being the president, but still, I just thought about the way he said, God, please reach down from the clouds and pinch my butt and make sure I'm not dreaming. Um, I I might die laughing if they run Hillary again. Oh, man, I hope, because I know he'd just crush her again, and I'd just, it'd be the it best be aneurysm hilarious. I ever yes. had. Mm-hmm. It would it would be uh, it would be a laugh riot. Although you know, I wouldn't. After all the things that have happened in the last eight years, I wouldn't shock me if if um, the joke was on us in the end and she ends up winning. So, uh, but it would be funny, I think. Yeah. Well, and you know what? Speaking of which, we got to talk about this. I don't think it's crazy town. I think it's only like crazy town adjacent, but it's worth discussing. You think there's a possibility that someone made sure that he had pretty thin security and his ass is hanging out this time? And these are the same people who framed him for Russiagate. I used to joke that that's just a hair away from riding him through Dallas with his bubble top off, you know? I, You know what? Um, I, previously, I would have said something like that is impossible. Uh, but, you know, I, I if... My co- podcast co-host Walter Kern brought up: if this were any other country, uh, and they looked at the situation that we're in, where it it, it, it just happened that uh, you know that the Democratic candidate proved to be non-viable, and it's on the eve of Trump becoming the nominee, and um, and then there was a you know, an assassination attempt and the, the, assa- the assassins killed. So there's the, the, no questions can be answered, really. Um, I don't know. I lived in Russia for a long time. There were a lot of political assassinations while I was there. Nobody thought twice about ascribing those to the government. Uh, but it, it's, it's, it's hard on an evidentiary basis to go there, except to say that the, a lot of the things that have been put out in response to this crisis are plainly unbelievable. Like, you know, the head of the Secret Service saying they didn't have anybody on that roof because there was a safety issue with the slope of that roof. Um, it's completely crazy. Which is just a terribly ridiculous story, you know? So, uh, and then, you know, for the for the, for it now to come out that there was a foot chase involving this person beforehand, that the person actually turned around and aimed a gun at, uh at local police well be- before the shooting that, that this was broadcast over a, an open uh security channel so that everybody was aware of of some of a suspect on that roof well before it happened i mean i it, it, a lot of these details they it's either extreme incompetence or something's off about the whole thing yeah now 
I mean, you'd have to come up with a hell of a story for how someone was controlling this kid and doing it or anything like that, or really influencing the local cops to do anything but just be themselves. It seems like, I mean, as far as my imagination stretches, the worst real accusation here would be that they just didn't give him enough men. And well, maybe we're yeah, sort of crossing believable. their fingers that something bad would happen and lightning would strike, you know? Well, for them to come out and give Bobby Kennedy Secret Service uh, protection the day after or, the, or a couple of days after is an admission that they were not doing it for political reasons beforehand. Right. So we, we know, you know, in that case, they were certainly doing something. With Trump, you know, he's a former president. He did have Secret Service. They they claimed afterwards that he actually had heightened Secret Service protection because of a threat from Iran, uh, which I don't know. That seems odd to me um, uh, because they, there were also new, news reports that they had to rely on local police, and that's how this thing got ha- happened. But uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, they're just. There have been some contradictory reports about why the, these security failures happen, but um, yeah, it's it's. I I know a lot of people who are here in Milwaukee right now who are absolutely convinced that there was something untoward about it, but it, it, there's nothing concrete that you can point to. Yeah, um, yeah, it sure doesn't seem like it. But uh, like you say, with Bobby Kennedy there, that. You know, like just to rephrase it in other words, is they didn't want to protect him because they thought that they'd be better off without him, man. You know, like not to be too, too blunt about it, but otherwise, what does it cost Biden to order the president or order the government to protect a candidate? Doesn't cost him anything to do that. No, um, no, yeah, and they also wanted. I think there there might have been a messaging aspect to that too, though. I mean, I think they wanted the public to get the idea that Kennedy wasn't a real candidate. Uh, no, that makes and, sense, I guess. But still, you know, pretty high risk way to send that message. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's beyond obnoxious. It's ridiculous. Mm-hmm. All right, now something important you said there was the name Rosa Brooks. Who's Rosa Brooks, Matt? Rosa Brooks is a Georgetown law professor who was a former Department of Defense official. Um, and I'm guessing that you know her name because of the Transition Integrity Project. Uh, am I right? Is that, did we talk about this before? Yeah, uh, in fact, I hope, I bet yeah, we, we probably we did, talked yeah. about it before the election of 2020, that these people had leaked to the Atlantic and the Washington Post about their crazy plans to prevent Trump from winning. Yep, they had and they conducted war games uh, where they had various people playing the roles of uh, Joe Biden and Donald Trump in the elect in the event of a contested election scenario. Uh, If I remember correctly, it was John Podesta who played Biden. Um, And so they had different scenarios where it was like a close race, but Trump uh, Trump won close race for Biden won, and then the other candidate. Uh, doesn't concede and then you know they uh, so they were looking at scenarios that might um, uh, come about and there were crazy things in there like you know Podesta as Biden in that war game which they called the Transition Integrity Project uh, th- there was one scenario where Trump won legally but uh, he decided not to concede as Biden and uh, had a basically the entire Entire West Coast secede from the United States. Um, and, and there's all kinds of crazy stuff in, in these documents, which they leaked to the they leaked to the media as kind of proudly that they did, that they did this. And then what happened was the journalist um, Ben Smith from the New York Times got the actual report, the full blown records of of, of the uh, of the simulation, and published it. And it was so embarrassing that they they kind of tiptoed away from it and actually by the time i did did the twitter files they were they were de-amplifying it as disinformation <laughs> so um yeah that was a remarkable little little scene so she, yes it's the same person and she was now involved in um promoting this idea of a blitz primary yeah i mean seriously as a non-partisan 
type. I was pretty astounded that Trump was going to lengths of trying to get alternative slates of electors um, submitted and all these kinds of things. It seems like, you know, like Nixon in 1960. Once they steal it from you, fair and square, then you shut up about it because otherwise it's just too much trouble for everybody else to put them through it, that kind of thing. And yet sure. it's it's very clear, as you say, these leaks that they put in the media first, that if it had been the other way around and Trump had won the election, as they put it, in anything but an absolute landslide, then they were prepared to do the same thing, nominate alternative slates of electors, as you say, even threaten secession of the West Coast states, anything they could yep. to overthrow the election the other way. So it's like watching Hamid Karzai yep, I mean, versus and, and, Abdullah and, and, Abdullah, you know? <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah, they, they even had uh, contingency plans for, um, you know, having crisis actors uh, create street disruptions and, and riots and things like that, you know, which speaks directly to there was actually even a section in there about uh, disturbance at the Capitol. Um, although that in that simulation, I believe, um, I forget who exactly created the disturbance in the simulation. I, so I don't want to, I don't want to uh, speak out of turn there, but there, there was definitely before January 6th happened in this transition, tr transition integrity report, a, uh, a predict, a kind of a prediction that the, that under some scenarios, there would be a disturbance at the Capitol, which is, which is sort of amazing. Yeah. Hey, y'all, let me tell you about Robertson Roberts Brokerage, Inc. Nobody trusts the U.S. dollar anymore. Foreign governments are stocking up on gold instead of $100 bills. One, they know they need to. And two, that means you need to, too. Interest rates are up, but for some reason, not much for savings accounts. Park your money there and watch Uncle Joe Biden just counterfeit its value away. You can see how the Fed is afraid to raise rates to beat inflation for fear of popping the current bubbles, at least before the election. So more inflation it will continue to be. Gold is your shield against monetary and price inflation, just like it always has been. Now Tim Fry and the guys over at Roberts & Roberts are recommending gold over silver since the world's almost 200 governments are putting their own pressure on the price, which should help everyone else who makes similar calls on their own. Of course, Roberts & Roberts can help you with platinum, palladium, and silver as well as gold. Don't let the Fed and the war party inflate all your savings away. Look up Roberts and Roberts at rrbi.co. That's rrbi.co. Hey, y'all, you should sign up for my Substack. It's scotthortonshow.substack.com. And if you do that, you'll get the interviews a day before everybody else. But not only that, they'll be free of commercials. How do you like that? Pretty good, huh? scotthortonshow.substack.com. Hey, y'all, LibertasBella.com is where you get Scott Horton Show and Libertarian Institute shirts, sweatshirts, mugs, and stickers and things, including the great Top Lobsters designs as well. See, that way it says on your shirt why you're so smart. Libertas Bella, from the same great folks who bring you Ammo.com for all your ammunition needs, too. That's LibertasBella.com. Hey, y'all, got kids or nephews or anything? You know about the Tuttle Twins books, right? Libertarian lessons about life, liberty, truth, and the state. It's really great stuff. And hey, did you guys know I'm a Tuttle Twin? Or, well, I'm a character in their world now. Skater Scott, local vert dog and anti-government know-it-all. They introduced me in a short book last year, and I hear they're going to develop my character's story a bit more in the future. Cool, right? Anyway, they're now celebrating 10 years and having sold millions of these books. And now they're giving away a free magazine at TuttleTwins.com slash 10 years. There's no shipping charge, and they're not going to ask for your credit card. It's just a free magazine. The gimmick is that inside the magazine, they've got a really great deal to get all the books. The best deal they've ever offered, which you will certainly want to take them up on. So go to TuttleTwins.com slash 10 years for your free magazine. And someday, hopefully soon, you and your kids will be reading all about the libertarian antics of cartoon me, along with all my new pals. That's TuttleTwins.com slash 10 years. All right, so now you have this article, The Surrender, which is... It's really about how there's this big shift. It, it's come with Biden's senility breaking through at the debate, and then now especially with the failed assassination attempt that they're just throwing their hands up. I mean, the fact is they're up against probably the most famous man who ever lived, right? He's worth a couple of Michael Jacksons or whatever at his height. 
Um, right, Ali. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. He is. He's what they call a mega star. Right. He's just and in in all different areas of life. Um, and so, like we're joking. Oh, they're gonna throw Klobuchar up against her or Butta Jug or one of these guys. It's never gonna work, right? Like, what are they gonna do? So, Axios had a quote, and I don't know if that's the Israelis or not. I don't necessarily trust it. There's obviously some agenda behind that site, but. They at least claim to have senior House Democratic leadership sources saying that, I think it was a direct quote, that they had reconciled themselves to another Trump term. And in a way, I think what I'm trying to get at here is, if there's a question in it, Matt, it's have they kind of finally unstigmatized Trump in a way or they've like normalized him? in a way that they probably could have accepted all along that like, well, he's a little bit of a winger, but he's an elected president. And are they sort of adjusting? Like, they're not going to call him a Russian agent anymore. They they stopped trying that. Yeah, I think that's, they've left themselves in a place where that's the only play they have left, which is what they should have done in the beginning, is just accept that he's a legitimately elected president and then criticize him as that, right? You know, go after his policies, go after things that he actually does. Uh, you know, the strategy that they pursued of claiming from the very start, before he even was inaugurated, that he was, uh, you know, an agent of foreign influence, you know, under the control of the Russians and creating this political emergency that lasts for years and years and years. And then when that one, you know, uh, sort of ended up a dud, Trump himself had a hand in creating the second legend, which was that he was, uh, you know, an existential threat to democracy who, um, you know, you had who was going to be the next Hitler and he had to be stopped at all costs. You know, now, uh, after that assassination attempt, you can't say that there was a direct cause and effect because we don't know why the assassination attempt happened. But certainly they had raised the temperature on emotional temperature around Trump. And they rec- you can see that they recognize that by, you know, moves like Morning Joe deciding not to air on Monday, um, which is kind of, I thought, an extraordinary admission by MSNBC to say, well, we have to <laughs> we haven't our, our lead morning news program isn't really a news program. So we have to take it off the air now. Um is so uh, yeah they're they're gonna have to go back to just treating him like a regular candidate who has a the, you know the support of half the country and that I, I think if they do that they'll actually end up having a better chance of beating him but they're, they're just too dumb to do it I, I, I is my guess yeah well and when the republicans fully embrace protectionism it's gonna not make sense to their audience for the Democrats to argue for free markets and low tariffs and this kind of thing in a kind of Bill Clinton third way argument, they're going to have to try to match Trump with Bernieism, which, I mean, after all, Biden has kept all of Trump's tariffs from before. Yeah, I was going to say like that. They can't make that argument because they kept them all <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, so. You know, and, and this is funny, so I, I, I talked to some pretty influential Republicans last night. And there, you know, there was one who was saying the thing that we're really, really worried about is is replacing uh, sort of the nanny state leftism with a, a nanny state, you know, right wing government. Um, and there were there, you know, there were some, there are definitely concerns within the party. There, there's a little bit of a schism within the Republicans about whether or not they're going to be leaning too much on tariffs, protectionism, uh, muscular, you know intervention domestically um but you know th- th- there's that's kind of the formula for trump's sort of populist thing uh he appeals to both the free market libertarian uh side but also this other thing and um but the democrats have to come up with an argument for it they just don't have any way of because they crushed bernie so hard they have no uh, organic policy connection to ordinary people who, you know, aren't doing so well. And I just don't, I don't know what they're going to do to fix that. And I, I always thought they should have gone with kind of an FDR type 
idea uh, last time around, but they, they didn't do it. And so they're, as you say, they're, they're going to have to make that turn back towards Bernie after crushing the actual Bernie. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. Just thinking back over the last few years of, you know, like we're talking about the way that they just completely delegitimized him and turned his, um, not to be a supporter cause I'm not, I know you're not either, but, um, the way that they turned it into such a controversy and really it all just came back to Hillary Clinton's temper tantrum that she couldn't just accept that it didn't work. She cheated. She played her Pied Piper strategy and it blew up in her face. And instead of just being embarrassed and going home and losing again, she insisted her and all of her partisans insisted on pushing forward with the Russiagate thing and pretending this guy was, as she put it a million times, an illegitimate president, which usually people who lose elections don't do that. You know what I mean? In fact, it's crazy oh, yeah. when when Trump was talking about, well, Biden should have to step down and let me back in there now because they stole it. People were like, what? That sounds crazy. But that was only like one shade crazier than what Hillary did and what the Democrats did to him. So they really have just turned everything into such a nutty deal. It would have been kind of crazy having a Trump presidency anyway, just because what a character he is. But what they have put the country through over their refusal to just accept our rejection of them is pretty extraordinary. They deserve to lose really bad now, for sure. Definitely. And I think my, my whole vision of how American politics works has changed because of exactly what you're talking about. Uh, you know, I've come around to the idea that you know, the, the distance between traditional Republicans and traditional Democrats was narrow enough that the kind of permanent national security state always felt comfortable that whoever won, uh, there would be continuity of some sort, right? They weren't, they were leaving some things to chance, but not much. And then Trump comes along and he sort of busts through all the different gatekeeping mechanisms to keep the rabble out. Uh, he didn't come from any of the traditional sort of political dynastic forces in this country. Uh, he didn't he didn't have to rely on the press. He, it was his own social media account that got through. And you're right, it was Hillary Clinton's te temper tantrum, but the, it also became a te temper tantrum of the national security state. They just were so furious that this had happened uh that somebody had who didn't have permission had gotten in I, I that's the way i look at it and that to me is really scary right because not now it's not just spite it's this uh, grotesque institutional reaction uh to loss of control which is i think it's the only way you can square the intensity of the of the campaign which has now basically failed yeah, I mean, I think with the assassination attempt, it's yeah, never say never, but I, I think it's impossible that they can revive it in earnest. But who knows? Yeah. What do you think? Do you think it's over, by the way? I mean, I'm curious you know what you think. Well, like if they're going to give up on on trying to stop Trump, like through extra, you know, kind of uh, uh, dirty tricks. Sort of means. Yeah. yeah. No, I don't know. I mean, I was just going to say, like, yeah, you're so right. I mean, you're reminding me, that, of course, as your great reporting above and beyond everybody else's shows that it wasn't Hillary and Perkins Coy. It was John Brennan, the director of the Central Intelligence Agency, who kicked this thing off back at the end of 2015. And we knew it had started at the end of 2015. And we knew there were British connections at the end of 2015 because of that kook in The Guardian, but still Luke Harding. Oh, yeah. But, Luke right. But Harding, now yeah. you showed, you and your sources have now showed, and if you remember the name of the article off the top of your head, uh, please do say it, uh, where, where you showed this is really the origin of the setting up of Papadopoulos and the attempted entrapment of Page and this kind of thing. It really all did start with Brennan going to the Brits and the Australians for help, setting up these Americans to frame Trump for treason, of all things. Yeah, and, and I think it was called like WMD Redux or something like that. I forget exactly what it was, but 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 this was based on the fact that we had gotten Michael Schellenberger and I had gotten access to, uh, you know, people who had conducted the House Intelligence Committee investigation of RussiaGate, and there there is 
a, a report that's still not released that's like 22 pages long sitting in the CIA somewhere that has a bunch of these details, but essentially 23, oh, I'm sorry, it was either 23 or 26 members of the Trump campaign uh, were placed under surveillance by uh, the FBI in, in 2015, 2016, and, uh, you know, also that they sort of cooked the intelligence in the, in the 2017 intelligence community assessment that, kind of, that sort of kicked off Russiagate, led to the Mueller investigation. And yeah, it was it was people like Brennan. Brennan was a huge part of this whole thing because uh, of the NSA, FBI, and CIA, who were the three major partners in that intelligence community assessment, only the CIA felt uh, firm that the Russians had interfered in favor of Donald Trump. The NSA kind of never did. Uh, they only eventually, um, and, and the FBI moved from moderate to strong in like the last month before that report came out um, after some arm twisting. So it was really Brennan. Uh, Brennan overruled people within his own team on that assessment too uh so they, he, he had dissenters even within the, within the cia um but yeah it, it, it it's the intelligence community kicked off that thing and and they, they kept pursuing it and you know i think they revealed themselves in, in domestic politics in a way they haven't probably since the 60s or 70s yeah and you know to read the durham report it's just shocking as far as, you know, you have to read between the lines a little bit, but not that much, where it's just clear that James Comey and all of the top executives of the FBI were deliberately conspiring to push this investigation forward long after they knew that there was nothing to it. All their informants were coming back empty handed. They're like in the timeline, deliberately withholding, um, you know, uh, disconfirming material from investigators who were still going down fake rabbit trails and so forth. Comey, if you remember, he had that amazing, uh, that famous testimony in the House in March of 2017 uh, when he said, you know, I can confirm, I, uh, I've been authorized to confirm that there is a Justice Department investigation of uh, administration or something like that. I forget the exact quote, but he, but he was in the hearings that were conducted by Adam Schiff and he confirmed the existence of an investigation and, there, and everybody instantly cooked up um, special sets to cover the next Watergate. They had John Dean on his guests on TV, right? This was, this was Watergate all over again. When Comey did that testimony, he already knew that all the investigations into all the other Trump associates like Papadopoulos and uh page um and i forget who there, there were there were uh, flynn um sessions. they had recommended the end of the flynn uh yeah sessions right uh, and there was one more i always forget this guy um but uh they had all kind of led to, no, to nothing um it, it, comey also knew already by then that the steel dossier clovis is that the name you're looking for Clovis was that he, he, but he didn't have a crossfire, uh, an official crossfire designation. Okay. One they had guy, tried to set him was. up. Yeah, they had tried to set him up, yeah. but it just didn't take right because he was just uncooperative right. with their suggestions. Yeah, but but basically the point is that Comey knew that none of that stuff had gone anywhere. They had nothing at that point, um, and you know that's why shortly afterward they. You know, the big news that propelled this story to the stratosphere you know, came a couple of weeks after that when they leaked that there had been, you know, the FISA warrant had been approved for Carter Page, because, which had to mean that he had been judged by a court to be an agent of a foreign power. And, you know, nobody did the math and said, what if that warrant application was was faked, which it was. So. Yeah, they, they were they were all lying through their teeth. And it, it's to this day, it's amazing to me that, that that's not a bigger story, as it's still amazing to me that the FBI was briefing the House and the Senate about 
uh, you know, the Hunter Biden laptop story is going to be Rus Russian di disinformation when it comes out. Uh, they did that. Um, so, yeah, I, th th they were behaving in ways that kind of make Watergate look like a small story, I think. And and yet we still haven't talked about it that way. Right. Um, uh, yeah, because it wasn't a Republican doing it. It was a Republican who was the victim of it. <laughs> so the media is just not as interested and not right. just a Republican, but an outsider and not not George W. Bush, but somebody who doesn't belong there. So uh, it's got a, a different set right. of incentives. But yeah, I mean, to compare it to Russiagate, it blows. I mean, pardon me, uh, to Watergate, it blows Watergate right out of the water that they would dare take on. And the American people's elected president this way is just incredible um, that they would do it. Yeah. Um, so anyway, I don't yeah. know. I can, we're, it's, it's probably going to be a while before before we reconcile that. But yeah, mm -hmm. I know. Well, and that's true because, yeah, again, the, the incentives still aren't there for a real reckoning. Although I guess we'll see once Trump's sworn in, whether he appoints a, a new prosecutor himself on that or, or has his attorney general launch another Russiagate probe or something. But um uh, it's very interesting, but now, so well, to answer your question to me, so. yeah, I would say I, I am waiting for the next thing for them to do to him. You know what I mean? Like maybe they won't kill him, but frame him for something else, try to indict him for something else, or I don't know, maybe run his car off the road. I don't know. Why not at this point? And by they, right. I mean the FBI and the CIA, I mean, you know, official power would, would they go to extraordinary lengths to stop him at this point? I mean, maybe, you know? I don't, yeah, I don't know. It's 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 so weird to think of your own government in that way. I just never I never thought about the United States in this way. Um, I, I feel like I've become so cynical mm -hmm. about, uh, you know, were you in Russia in 93? Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, OK. Yep. During the coup. Oh, yeah. See, I was here in 93 and they burned all the Branch Davidians to death right at the street from my house. So I've been cured since then. Wow. You were just too far away. Oh, I see. <laughs> yeah, you're right, right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I guess oh, was that that was close, close, to, close to where you were, huh? Well, a hundred miles in Texas is not that far. Right, <laughs> yeah. right. That's right. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, I missed all that. So that's that's on me, I guess. Yeah, the, but but yeah, it's been a shock the, the, this last period, and um, you know, we'll we'll see what happens. Yeah. Okay. So one more thing before I let you go, which is just in case you run into this guy Vance. You could like frame it in the form of a journalist question like, hey, have you ever read J.J. Goldberg's articles in the forward about how badly Netanyahu wanted America to attack Iraq back in 2002? Because, you know, him and Sharon weren't twins and didn't agree on everything because I don't know if you saw this where Vance's text messages were leaked where he's saying, if America had only listened to Israel, we would have never attacked Iraq. And I just want to pull what's left of my hair out, but I don't want to do that. I had to resist. Did he really say that? He I really know. said that. And it is true that Sharon, at least at first, had said, geez, you really ought to go to Tehran first. But once it was clear Bush was going to Baghdad, Sharon got on board for that. But it was clearly Netanyahu's preference, and all the neocons were Netanyahu's men. And I just hate to see an Iraq war veteran Talking about, yeah, if only we defer to Israel more, then we'd stay out of Middle East wars. Like, man, I can't facepalm myself that hard without giving myself a concussion. <laughs> wow, that is pretty messed up. I mean, um, if I if I see him, I'll ask him for sure. J.J. Goldberg? Yeah, J.J. Goldberg. I mean, he's the guy who's like, listen, everybody, you got to understand the division between Sharon and Netanyahu and the Likud party over there. And it's Netanyahu and his men who are pushing this thing. And that's who we know as the neoconservative fifth column in America. You know, Richard Pearl and his buddies. Oh. That's oh, them. Wow. Okay. That's Amazing. them. All right. Well, the I'll cabal. check it out oh, for sure. All right. You're a good man, Matt. Thank you for doing my show, dude. <laughs> Thanks, Scott. No problem. Take care. Thanks for having me on. Oh, yeah. Appreciate it. Thank you. The Scott Horton Show, Anti-War Radio, can be heard on KPFK 90.7 FM in L.A. APSradio.com. Antiwar.com, scotthorton.org, and libertarianinstitute.org.